Today, um, then, as Reiner mentioned, I will be talking about uh, work that's been done, sorry, in trying to quantify and directly map uh, the changing surface elevation on our planet, resulting from dynamics deep inside of our, uh, deep inside the planet. The official kickoff for this project, which is entitled Geodynamic Perturbations of Climate Signals or GIPTIS, uh, there were unfortunately pandemic delays as many of you already have encountered yourselves. And the official kickoff date uh, was uh, November, 2020. Uh, the work I'll be presenting to you today, therefore is very much, uh, I would say work in progress. And it has benefited from the contributions and collaborations with several uh, individuals that are shown here on, on this page. This work is, as you'll see, is very multidisciplinary, in fact, extremely multidisciplinary and requires expertise from diverse fields, uh, from carbonate geochemistry to radiometric dating, to paleogeography, to uh, computational geodynamics and High performance computing on very large parallel computers. So there's quite a remarkable array of expertise that's needed to actually make sure that this work can be successfully accomplished. And therefore, I'm very fortunate to have had these collaborators and contributors to help out in this effort. And uh, they include uh, Andrea Dutton, who's at the University of Wisconsin, my colleague in Canada, Peter Glishovich, and my colleagues in France, Marianne Greff and below Jacques Lascar at the Observatoire de Paris, and Marianne Greff is uh, with me at the IPGP in Paris. Also doctoral student uh, Marie Cayan at the University of Florida and a colleague at the University of Chicago, David Rowley. So once again, I acknowledge their contributions which are essential for the success of this project. Um, the scientific motivation for this project can be encapsulated with this quotation that you see here on, on the screen. Uh, quotation from a former American president, Theodore Roosevelt, who in 1910 stated, full knowledge of the past helps us in dealing with the future. And this is definitely true with respect to the perspective that uh, is taken in this project. Uh, in the past, in the geologic past, as shown in this diagram, uh, geologists have identified several warm periods uh, in which temperatures uh, were comparable to present day temperature, if not actually somewhat warmer. Some of these warm periods include uh, uh, the last interglacial 125,000 years ago. And in geologic literature, this is uh, also referred to as marine isotope stage 5E. Uh, further back in time, we have the marine isotope stage 11, 400,000 years ago. And even further back in time, going to the mid Pliocene, we have another warm period where actually the temperatures were estimated to be even higher than in the previous two interglacials that I just identified. One of the key aspects also of this geologic data set is the evidence for significantly higher sea level relative to today. For example, at the last interglacial, global average sea level is estimated to be somewhere between six to nine meters higher than today, and even higher 400,000 years ago, and even higher than that uh, in the uh, mid Pliocene. Now, when we look at some of these temperatures relative to pre-industrial, we recognize that uh, with the current rates of global warming, by the end of the 21st century, we'll be definitely entering some of the same temperature ranges that are estimated, for example, in the last interglacial for sure, but even likely what temperatures not seen since the mid Pliocene. And so this is of course, very important uh, to understand sea level as well. And the, in particular, how ice sheets respond, the polar ice sheets to these higher temperatures. The stability of these ice sheets is directly reflected in these global average sea level uh, variations that you see summarized in this diagram. 
Now, in this time period, uh, extending back over the past few million years, as shown here in the horizontal axis at the bottom, the one process that is thought to be generally dominant in terms of predicting and driving sea level change associated with ice uh, mass variations is a process that's uh, called glacial isostatic adjustment. And the variations in the Earth's tall, solid topography elevation and the variations of sea level that accompany those changes in topography are generally regarded as the single most important process that affects uh, the interpretation of sea level across this entire time span. Now, the topography that could be produced and the resulting sea level changes associated with longer time scale process, uh, a process that's called mantle convection. This is the process that drives the Earth's tectonic plates at the Earth's surface. The vertical displacements of the surface, uh, something that is called dynamic topography, is generally regarded as much slower uh, and therefore potentially less important than the process of glacial isostatic adjustment. And this is in fact summarized here in the diagram where we see the GIA is important on all time scales going back essentially to the Pliocene. And dynamic topography only becomes essentially important as we go further and further back in time because the process is so slow. And that's something we'll investigate in this uh, in the study that I'll be reporting here. First of all, let's uh, make sure we understand what I mean by dynamic topography. This is illustrated uh, in this cartoon here on the bottom. Dynamic topography is the variable vertical displacement indicated by these blue arrows of Earth's solid surface. And this displacement is produced by vertically acting stresses. The stresses are generated by buoyancy forces. In other words, regions which are hot or cold in the mantle. And here, for example, is a region of the mantle which is hot. Because it's hot, it's less dense. It will tend to rise inside the Earth's interior. The movement upwards will generate flow, which is schematically represented by these arrows. And that upward movement will therefore generate stresses, which then move the surface upward over the hot regions. And vice versa over regions that are colder and hence more dense than the surrounding material. And these movements of hot and cold material is called in fluid mechanics, it's called thermal convection. And this process is also occurring in the Earth's mantle. And it's this movement of hot and cold rocks that also drive the horizontal movements of the Earth's surface that we call plate tectonics. Now, it's important to recognize that these movements are occurring um, in material that is actually solid. I mean, the rocks, of course, are not liquid. They're not fluid in any conventional sense. But we can think of any given rock as shown here as having inside of it two types of behavior uh, that the two types are represented schematically here by a spring, which represents the short-term elastic behavior of rocks. We know that the rocks have an elastic behavior because earthquakes generate waves and those waves travel through the Earth's interior. Just think of what happened in Tonga a few days ago. The entire planet vibrated as a result of the energy that was released by that uh, event. But on longer time scales, the very same rocks that seem to behave like elastic bodies also behaves viscously. And this is represented here by a dash pot, a viscous dash pot. And the parameter that controls the slow viscous behavior of rocks is called viscosity. And for rocks, of course, we would use the term effective viscosity because the rocks are not actually fluid, but on long enough time scales, and provided the temperatures are sufficiently high, then the rocks deform and they flow. And this is why we actually refer to this movement inside the Earth's mantle is a process of thermal convection, very much like what you have when you heat a beaker of water very slowly. The hot, less dense water rises to the surface and the cold water at the surface descends. And this is exactly what's happening inside the Earth's mantle on very long time scales and with a viscosity, an effective viscosity that is many, many orders of magnitude larger than any conventional fluids we would be familiar with. But nonetheless, the physics is the same. So what are the time scales with which this, these movements inside of the Earth can actually perturb or displace the Earth's surface? 
And these timescales were revealed uh, in a study uh, that was carried out uh, with my colleague, David Rowley, back in 2013, where we were looking at dynamic topography changes along the East Coast of the United States. What you see here, by the way, is just a high resolution digital elevation model uh, that it shows the low relief topography extending from New England all the way down to the southern tip of Florida. And draped over that relief, you have these contour lines, which are the predictions of the change or vertical movement up or down of the Earth's surface over the past 3 million years since the Pliocene. And at this time, we were looking to study uh, the elevation of this geologic feature called the Orangeburg Scarp, which is warped. And what we found is that this warping of the Orangeburg Scarp can be very well described by the forces, vertical forces originating in the Earth's interior. And those forces are capable of displacing the Earth's surface up and down by tens of meters over just a few million years. And in this case, three million years. So the implication is that these very same forces then should be able to displace the Earth's surface significantly by at least a few meters, if not more, on timescales of 100,000 years. If this would take us then back to the last interglacial. And this was indeed confirmed in some earlier studies published over the last few years. So how do we quantify and evaluate whether these vertical displacements uh, can be correctly predicted or not using models of the Earth's interior, well, we have to look at field data. And in the case of the Pliocene, we have once again, uh, as I just mentioned, this remarkable geographic or physiographic feature, which is actually a fossil shoreline that extends from the trail ridge in Northern Florida and becomes what is called the Orangeburg Scarp in Georgia and Carolina, and then extends up into New England in the fall zone. And so this is a, essentially a Pliocene marine terrace uh, with, uh, with rocks and shells that have uh, mid-Pliocene age. If we want to verify more recent displacements, then we have this very interesting data set that was actually collected by Andrea Dutton concerning um, the last interglacial. And the two study areas include Western Australia, where you see here this coral reef terrace that is uh, five meters higher than present day sea level. This is uh, an elevation which is corrected for the effects of glacial isostatic adjustment, as well as another site in the Seychelles in the Indian Ocean where the corrected elevation is 7.6 meters with uncertainties that you see here. So the inference and the actual evidence is that sea level at the last interglacial was significantly higher than the present day. Can we explain this now using some of the models that are displacing the Earth's surface up and down using on, the, on geological timescales? And this then leads us to actually this question. This is the key question that is going to be addressed in this presentation. Can the vertical movements in the Earth's interior sufficiently impact the elevations of these sites? And what is the implications of that impact in terms of our understanding of sea level and hence the stability of the polar ice sheets? So to begin, we have to recognize that we can uh, only construct these mantle models or mantle dynamic models if we have a certain number of essential inputs on hand. And let me quickly summarize what it is that we need to actually carry out this kind of modeling. First of all, we need a representation of the distribution of the what is called the effective viscosity of the rocks in the mantle. We need to know what the viscosity of these rocks are everywhere at all depths in the mantle, starting from the crust right down essentially to the liquid core of our planet. So this is quite a, a remarkable requirement. And a lot of effort has gone in just to trying to determine what the value of this viscosity is. And I'll summarize that in a few slides. Secondly, and perhaps one might argue perhaps most importantly, we need a mapping of the buoyancy forces. Where are the hot and cold regions located in the Earth's interior? We need to map their locations and we need to actually understand what is the magnitude of those anomalies are. And so we'll need um, a model that shows the three-dimensional distribution everywhere in the Earth's mantle of density perturbations, because these density perturbations 
drive uh, or actually generate the buoyancy forces that drive mantle convection. And of course, because this is a fluid mechanical calculation where the mantle is moving in response to the vis uh, density perturbations, we'll need to understand what the boundary conditions are that we should apply at the top of the mantle. And in this case, we have to worry about, for example, tectonic plates. What is the influence of tectonic plates on the flow that actually is generated in the Earth's interior? Some of the key questions that arise when we carry out this kind of modeling are the following. First of all, do these models even predict correctly the present day topography of our planet? That's obviously a, a requirement. If they don't, then we have to go back to the drawing board and improve the models. Secondly, if we're able to fit the present day topography correctly, how does this topography evolve in time? In other words, we'll need to figure out how these density perturbations in the Earth's interior are shifting in, in terms of their positions with time and how does their magnitude change with time? And then how does this change ultimately reflect itself in changes in topography? And finally, because viscosity is such a key parameter in all of this modeling, how sensitive are these predictions to complex variations of viscosity that perhaps we don't fully understand, both in the Earth's interior and at the Earth's surface, notably the tectonic plates? So let's look at the first ingredient, which is mantle viscosity. This is perhaps one of the most classic problems in geophysics that goes back practically to the beginning of the 20th century, indeed even the 19th century, where we're trying to understand the stiffness, essentially, of the rocks in the Earth's interior that allow us to explain a host of processes at the Earth's surface. And most classically, the process that is controlled by mantle viscosity is post-glacial rebound or glacial isostatic adjustment. This is a process that occurs on thousand year timescales. But on longer timescales, millions of years, viscosity also controls plate tectonics and the movement of rocks on million year timescales in the Earth's interior. So in a work that was carried out essentially over the last decade and even earlier than that, notably with my colleague, Jeremy Trevitsa, we use the entire suite of data available to us involving post-glacial rebound or GIA and data associated with mantle convection in an inversion, a mathematical inversion, which helps us to determine or estimate the variation of viscosity shown by these solid lines as a function of depth all across the mantle. Zero is the Earth's surface, right down to the Earth's core, 3,000 kilometers depth. And we've determined a whole family of models that is capable of properly matching these two data sets. And what I'll focus on is two models, which I've simply labeled here V1, V2, shown here, which represent the very large increase of viscosity with depth. Notice that the horizontal axis here is logarithmic. So the viscosity increases by more than three orders of magnitude over 2000 kilometers of depth. This is a very large increase in the stiffness of the rocks. And that needs to be properly represented if we're going, if we have any hope then of obtaining realistic predictions of the movements of the rocks inside the Earth's interior. The next vital ingredient, as I mentioned, is a mapping of the three-dimensional structure in the Earth's interior. And this requires us to look at what seismologists call seismic tomography. Seismic tomography essentially illuminates or allows us to see these structures inside of the Earth. After each and every earthquake, the energy that's propagating out from the earthquake travels through these regions, these anomalous regions, and the anomalies that are recorded by these, earth, uh, by these propagating waves are registered by seismometers at the Earth's surface. And we have a global deployment of seismometers today that record all of the perturbations to propagating earthquake waves. And by mathematically inverting those perturbed earthquake waves, the measurements of those perturbed earthquake waves, we can reconstruct in three dimension the structure of the Earth's interior. I think the closest analog in everyday uh, experience is a CAT scan. Essentially, uh, a CAT scan in geophysics is done with earthquakes rather than with X-rays, but essentially the principle is very much the same. So let's look at one of the models uh, that has been developed, one that has been very often used in these types of calculations that was derived 
by uh, a colleague in the US, Ritzema. Here is a mapping in this depth interval, uh, 300 to 400 kilometers of lateral variations in structure at this depth where everything that's colored red and orange is region of the Earth's interior that's estimated to be hot and therefore less dense. And everything that you see blue here is estimated to be colder than average and therefore more dense. The difficulty with this model is that it represents something called shear velocity anomalies. And what we need are not velocity anomalies, we need density. Density provides the buoyancy forces. And so we have to do additional work. We have to convert this model into an equivalent model of density anomalies. And for that, we have to appeal to some further information from mineral physics or direct uh, inversions to translate this map into equivalent map of density anomalies. And this adds further uncertainty. Another effort, which I was involved with directly myself, involves inverting similar data to what we showed earlier, seismic data, but on top of it, we also inverted geodynamic data. And this data produces a map this time, directly map lateral density variations everywhere in the mantle. And we do this by also including mineral physics data in the inversions. And so this then provides us at the very same depth as the previous map, a view of the buoyancy forces. So everything that's red here is light and tends to move upwards. Everything that's blue is heavy and tends to move downwards. Let's compare these two models and we can see that in many locations, the models agree, but they are many locations where they also disagree. And so this is meant to simply highlight that there are still outstanding uncertainties in our maps of the three-dimensional structure in the Earth's interior. We have to keep that in mind. So in trying to understand these differences between the different maps that we have of the three-dimensional structure, one way that we can verify whether those maps are any good um, in simple language is by seeing whether they can explain present day observations associated with the movements inside the Earth's interior. For example, we have tectonic plate velocities at the Earth's surface. Can the models explain those plate velocities? We have gravity anomalies also measured by satellites. Do the models explain that? Do the models explain the topography seen today on our planet? And we see here that the model that was most recently developed actually does a fairly good job of explaining all of those observations. So this model, which directly maps density, gives us some degree of confidence that at least we're capturing the buoyancy forces correctly. The other seismic model does a fair job, not as well. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use predictions of all four models in a way of, if we wish to assess or explore the uncertainties, because this is very important that we have some estimate at least of the uncertainties in these predictions that come from integrating all of the forces inside the Earth's interior. Now, we talked about matching observations today, and this is the only mathematical slide I'll show you in this presentation, but it's very important that we also understand how the structure in the Earth has evolved in the past. And for this, we appeal to thermodynamics. And so we look at the equation of energy conservation, and what we've done is we've time reversed the energy conservation equation in a way that allows us to reconstruct the evolution and the position of the temperature anomalies inside the earth from the past to the present. And we've done this in an iterative way. So mathematically what we do is we start at the present day, we go backwards, we take that first guess, we go forwards. Is the first guess close to where we started from? If it's not, we make a correction, we go backwards, forwards, backwards and forwards, from the present to the past, to the present, to the past, and so on until we converge. So this is an iterative process that allows us to reconstruct the evolution of the Earth's interior over many millions of years going into the Earth's past. And here's uh, an early model which shows us how well we do in reconstructing the evolution of those anomalies from the past to the present. And what you see here is the 30 million year reconstruction of all of the anomalies that lie beneath North America, extending from the Pacific West Coast 
going underneath Colorado, going underneath the Mississippi Basin in this region called the New Madrid Seismic Zone in Tennessee and Arkansas, and then extending to the US East Coast under New Jersey. And what you see in this cross section is the movement of material and of the anomalies, the hot and cold regions that are reconstructed using this mathematical procedure that I described in the previous slide. But most importantly, as these anomalies change their position and their strength, at the surface, if you keep your eyes on this red curve, this is the solid surface of the, our planet, its elevation. And what we see is that the solid surface will move up and down depending on the reorganization of these density anomalies in the Earth's interior. And those vertical displacements, as we will see, are actually significant and substantial. So their importance is illustrated explicitly in this global map in which I plot in red and blue colors, the upward movement and the downward movement that the Earth's surface has experienced in just 125,000 years. This is the last, this takes us back to the last interglacial. And what you can appreciate from this map is that many parts of the Earth's surface has been have been displaced upwards or downwards <clears throat> by as much as 15 meters over the course of this uh, 125,000 year interval. Let's look at that uh, close up and see what the implication is, let's say for topography change in the Caribbean. Here we're zooming in in the Gulf of Mexico and the surrounding Caribbean. And once again, the red colors indicates topography elevation or increase over 125,000 years ago and the blue indicates decrease on the scale that you see here in the bottom, plus or minus 10 meters. And here I show you explicitly the variation in the prediction of topography, depending on which global model of the Earth's interior you're using. We see that these two models, one called gypsum and the other called S40RTS, both models represent the distribution of density in the Earth's interior. And we can see that their predictions of topography change are at least visually similar. We see regions of subsidence here in the central part of the Gulf of Mexico, extending to the Yucatan, and the other model predicts similar subsidence. Likewise here, although the actual, notice the position is somewhat offset relative to what we have in the first map. The elevation of Florida over the last 125,000 years ago is predicted by both models not quite in the same amount, but at least both models are showing that Florida has indeed gone up most of the peninsula over the last 125,000 years. Now, <clears throat> while these look at least visually similar, if we subtract the two, we can see that there are differences that are also non-negligible. In fact, the differences between these models are almost as large as the predictions themselves. So this is something to keep in mind. And the one might be, troubled by this and say, well, that's a fairly large uncertainty, but let's not forget that this model does also a much better job in fitting the present day data than this model. So when we evaluate these uncertainties, we should also evaluate the fact that the models do not perform similarly in regards to their fit to the data. So this is just meant as a warning that there's still work to be done in quantifying these uncertainties. What about the effect or uncertainties that arise from the complicated distribution of viscosity in the Earth's interior? And one of the greatest complications is right at the Earth's surface. We know that the Earth is made up of tectonic plates. The plate interiors we know are rigid or resistant to deformation, whereas the plate boundaries are very weak. And it's this weakness, of course, that allows the plates to move. Otherwise, there would be no plate tectonics on the Earth's surface. What is the impact of such large lateral variations in strength on, let's say, topography change? And this is illustrated in some new work that's done by uh, our doctoral student, Marie Kayan, where we look at the Caribbean region once again. And let's look at, for example, two sites in the Bahamas, San Salvador Island and Great Inagua Island to the south. The blue curve shows you the change in topography over the past 125,000 years, this, the maps show topography change over this time scale. When you have 
Lateral viscosity variations associated with weak plate boundaries and strong plates. And in red, when you have no such lateral variations, the viscosity only changes with depth. Now, in the case of San Salvador Island, the effect is not so strong. There is an effect, but it's not as strong as, for example, in this case, Great Inagua Island, as it turns out, is very close to a plate boundary that goes through the Caribbean. And when you include lateral viscosity variations, notice that the trend is completely changed. We have subsidence in the case of, of prediction without lateral viscosity variations, but we actually have uplift in the case where those variations are included. So we literally have the opposite polarity in the prediction. In the case of Bermuda, Grape Bay in particular, we find that in both cases, whether we include those, that complexity of lateral viscosity variations, the Earth's surface goes up and actually goes up by over 10 meters in the last 125,000 years. Significant vertical displacements, which in this case are not that sensitive to such rheological complexity. Now let's look at the Indian Ocean. This is where Andrea Dutton has collected data uh, associated with these coral reef terraces that I showed you in the pictures in the earlier part of this presentation. And the Seychelles are located right here, particularly the location called La Digue. This is the topography change given by this suite of four different models. Notice the variations in the predictions. And this, if you wish, would be a mapping of the uncertainties. All models show that La Digue on the Seychelles has subsided from, the, from 125,000 years ago to today. The subsidence is of the order of four to five meters, depending on which model you include. And that subsidence is actually part of a longer term process, which has gone on at least since the last five million years. So our models go further back in time and we can see to what extent the recent changes are part of a longer term trend. And this will help us, for example, when we go back to the Pliocene. So in conclusion, what we find from these predictions is that all models agree that there is subsidence, significant subsidence. And the amount of subsidence over the last 125,000 years is at least of the order of three meters. What about the effect of lateral viscosity variations in the Indian Ocean? Once again, we have a very important plate boundary that goes right here through the Indian Ocean. You see it here. Now, are the Seychelles affected by the presence of this weak zone? And in the map that you see here, the plot in the bottom, the presence of that weak zone actually is remarkably insensitive, at least as far as the topography change in the Seychelles. So in this sense, we have a lot of confidence in that subsidence, whether or not we explicitly model the complexity is associated with this plate tectonic boundary. Another region which Andrea Dutton has studied is Western Australia. Uh, these two sites, Ningaloo and Fall Bay. And this is a prediction of the topography change, once again, over the last 125,000 years. And as you can see in Western Australia, in Ningaloo, we have subsidence of the order of two meters and even stronger subsidence in the southern site located in Fowl Bay. And so in summary, Ningaloo has at, perhaps at most one meter of subsidence, whereas Fowl Bay is subjected to at least four meters, once again, due to the changes in the forces that arise in the Earth's interior. So what are the implications then? Let's look once again at these two far field stable sites, stable in quotations, because it's thought that these sites are sufficiently far away from tectonically active zones that their recording of sea level is robust. But as we've seen, nonetheless, the mantle is moving underneath both sites. And so when we incorporate the additional displacement of the surface associated with movements in the Earth's interior, the corrected height of these sites at 125,000 years ago, in the case of Western Australia, is six meters with this uncertainty that you see here, plus or minus two and a half. And in the Seychelles, it's at least 9.6 meters. So what are the implications then for the magnitude of global mean sea level during the last interglacial? 
Well, the implications are is that these shifts in the sea level markers imply, as we've seen, six to nine meters of meltwater contribution, quite likely and most likely from the Antarctic ice sheet. This is the current consensus that meltwater that would have emerged from the Antarctic ice sheet during the last interglacial. Now, this is obviously a rather sobering perspective when we consider the future warming that our planet is yet to experience, which takes us not only into what would be considered temperatures experienced during the last interglacial, but indeed probably temperatures that were also experienced during the mid-Pliocene. What do these temperature increases do to the stability of the ice sheets? Many modeling studies have been carried out which show that West Antarctica in particular, this part of the Antarctic ice complex is very fragile or unstable in a warming climate. And this has been borne out actually by this very interesting recent compilation and uh, direct study of the ice mass balance in Antarctica extending essentially over the last 40 years. This is a, a study published by Rigno, Eric uh, Rigno and colleagues in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2019. And this is a figure taken from his paper where he shows the mass changes across Antarctica over this 40 year period. Everything that's colored in blue is mass gain. Everything in red is mass loss. And you can see that there is accelerating mass loss in West Antarctica, which will contribute to accelerating sea level change um, in, as we go ahead towards the end of the 21st century. Also of interest notice is the mass loss that's experienced in East Antarctica. It was generally thought that East Antarctica is much more stable than West Antarctica, but this compilation of mass loss indicates um, a warning that these sectors, this is the region in East Antarctica called Wilkes Land. Uh, the grounding line for the ice sheets in Wilkes Land is below sea level and therefore likely to become more unstable as the surrounding water temperature begins to increase very much as we see here in West Antarctica. So what we see then is that during the last interglacial, this much water was likely to have entered into the global oceans. And we expect that most of this would have emerged from melting on the Antarctic ice sheet, melting that we will expect to see amplify as we go ahead in, in an ever warming world. So what are the future objectives that we'll study in this project? One of them is to improve our understanding of the three-dimensional structure of the Earth's interior. As we've seen, there are still outstanding uncertainties in our maps of the forces that generate topography change. So we need to try to bring down those uncertainties by incorporating more recent higher resolution models. Also, as we've seen, viscosity is an important parameter that controls the topography change that moves the surface up and down with time. And in particular, we've seen that lateral variations, depending on the location, can be very important. And so we'll need to improve our estimates of mantle viscosity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, we would like to extend our analysis to other geographic sites that record last interglacial sea level. And there is a global compilation effort underway it's called the World Atlas of Last Interglacial Shorelines, or WALIS. This is an effort spearheaded by Rovere, Alessio Rovere and colleagues as part of an ERC project. This is an important compilation that covers large parts of the Earth's surface where LIG shorelines have now been measured and we will actually extend our analysis to these sites. And we'll also consider other warm periods. As I've indicated, Given the degree of warming that's being experienced in the 21st century, it's also important to understand what happened in the mid Pliocene as a guide to the changing sea level that we might anticipate uh, will occur on our planet. And so we'll look at sites that record mid Pliocene sea levels as well. And in further work that I haven't had a chance to discuss today, we'll also see how these changes in the Earth's shape due to movements in the interior also control variations in what's called the elliptical shape of our planet. And those changes in elliptical shape are critical to understanding perturbations to the famous Milankovitch insulation cycles. This is ongoing work and we hope to have some results 
soon, or perhaps in a future talk to present. Thanks very much for attending. Any questions I'm happy to entertain at this moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alessandro. I guess that was a masterclass for most of us in uh, Earth's mental dynamics. Um, yeah, I, um, uh, as everyone hopefully knows, you can ask questions by either typing it into the chat, uh, into the question and answer tool, or also just raise your hand. I will then uh, either read the question or uh, give you the chance to speak. Um, yeah, maybe first question from my side, uh, if I understand it correctly. So the movement of the Earth at the different locations might actually change our picture, how uh, the sea level changed in the past. Yes. Um, so is that is that something that was then not considered 10 years ago and, and the research 10 years ago is, is to some extent biased by this? I, I, it wasn't fully appreciated, as I mentioned at the outset. Um, the process that's generally regarded as dominant, let's see if I can bring that slide up, is glacial isostatic adjustment, but commonly called post-glacial rebound. This is the movements of the surface on 100,000 year time scales. It was thought until actually about a decade ago, it was thought that post-glacial rebound dominated the movements up and down of our planet over this time frame, over the last few million years. That is because there were these large ice shields on, on Eurasia yes. and they pushed it down and then it comes up again. That's right. And the amplitude of those vertical displacements of the order of hundreds of about a hundred meters of vertical movement on time scales of about a hundred thousand years. It was generally thought that the mantle is so slowly moving that um, it would produce negligible variations in the elevation of the Earth's surface on those time scales. Mm -hmm. But what we find now is actually the mantle is moving much faster in actual in actuality than we anticipated. We can produce vertical displacements of 15 or 20 meters even on 100,000 year time scales. That is approaching the amplitude of the movements associated with post-glacial rebound. And that long-term displacement, because it's long-term, affects our interpretation, for example, of even something as recently as the last interglacial, in other words, MIS-5e. Those sites that Andrea Dutton measured in the Indian Ocean, which are displaced upwards by five to six meters, those are amplitudes that are also displaced slowly by mantle convection beyond what post-glacial rebound can do. So this was indeed a surprise. This is something we hadn't anticipated. Thank you very much. I think that's a key question, actually. Thank you for asking it. Okay, we have here, Colin. Okay, uh, yeah, so Bernard, well, Kizunga has a question whether these movements are also impacted by humans, especially by buildings or excavation. So if you think that, that, uh, that there is some up and down due to human activity of the Earth's mantle. Well, well, the Earth responds to any changes in weight at the Earth's surface. It's undoubtedly there. The question is, what is the amplitude of that response and the time scale? So on the time scale of human activity, basically the crust moves down or up elastically in response to those changes in weight at the Earth's surface. And so the crust is mostly supporting the weight. The mantle does very little in, in that regard. Now, obviously, as our cities grow larger and larger, the mass associated with those structures becomes significant. But again, it's occurring on very short time scales. And on those time scales, the Earth's interior responds like an elastic. It's when you go on time scales of thousands of years that the mantle slowly begins to creep finally in response to those weights. So anything that occurs on time scale of the human lifespan is essentially governed by the elastic response of the earth, not by the movement of rocks in any significant way. It's a good question. But, but I, I think that in some, some regions, for example, cities are moving up and down because they are not built or mostly down because they are not built on such solid ground, right? 
We see that in Jakarta, in Indonesia. We see that in Louisiana, for example, New Orleans. The rocks, as they become compacted under, or actually the porosity of those rocks changes in response to the changes in weight at the Earth's surface, that actually leads to subsidence, but that subsidence is occurring right at the surface. It's not occurring in the mantle. Um, and that's, of course, very important. Obviously, in the case of Jakarta, it's turning out to be extremely important because there's even discussion of moving the entire city because of that subsidence. Okay. Um, I mean, you didn't show this, uh, but what, what is the expected uh, sea level changes in, in like the next, uh, uh, until the end of the century? Oh, yes. Actually, this is part of what the IPCC has now just recently compiled. And the global sea level increase associated with this accelerating mass loss it can be significant. It can, can be of the order of one, perhaps two meters of sea level rise by the end of the 21st century, depending on which CO2 pathway the planet is on. Um, but we seem to be breaking records. And so the sea level increase will be significant. And much of that might well come from melting of the Antarctic ice complex, as we've seen in that recent study by Rigno, Eric Rigno and his colleagues. Okay, so we have another question by Venka Kapamani. Is there a difference in the rebound effect between longitudinally uniform advanced recession of ice sheets versus mass loss on a single plate? Ah. I want to make sure I understand that question. Let me see. Um, yes. uh, my question is about Greenland to be specific. So mass loss in Greenland is a single plate, which is going to rebound. But if you if there is just equatorward poleward a movement of ice sheets between the interglacial maximum and today, all the plates will rebound same amount. So the relative difference may not be as much. I'm sticking. Yes, but of course, the Earth responds most strongly under the region where the mass loss is greatest. So you'll have the most, the strongest changes in the vicinity of where the mass changes the most. That then has, there's a far field effect associated with that, mm -hmm. which is global. Um, and this actually leads to an entirely separate question is, which is how much does each individual ice sheet on our planet affect sea level? And it affects sea level in different ways. Uh, there are things called fingerprints of ice sheets. And these are well, well established, actually. The models that, uh, some of the models, including those that I've described here, are, allow us to fingerprint the sea level change associated with melting on different ice caps. Mm -hmm. And it's variable. Each ice sheet has its own fingerprint. So this is important because if we want to understand sea level change, let's say in the US East Coast or in, along the Indian shoreline, that sea level change will vary depending on which ice sheet is actually melting. And this actually sets up a nice problem where we can try to estimate the melting occurring on different ice sheets based on what we see in sea level change in different parts of the globe. Thank you. So that means in, in some cases, maybe that the glaciers disappear in the Andes might mean that also South America lifts up a little and that therefore, it, I mean, probably the effect will be smaller than yes. the global sea level rise, but it will not, th this effect is also there. Exactly. And what, one of the things that's emerged from these studies of the Earth's response to mass loss at the Earth's surface is that the one location where you most want to be if ice is melting, is directly next to the ice. Because the loss of mass actually reduces the gravitational pull of the ice. In other words, sea level goes down in the vicinity of the ice sheet and increases further away. This is, for many people, counterintuitive, but actually physically makes perfect sense. So if you're worried about rising sea level due to Greenland, I recommend you invest in real estate next to Greenland because sea level rise elsewhere in the globe will be much higher. Actually, sea level will drop in the vicinity of Greenland for the next few hundred years. Then eventually there's a re-equilibration which occurs. But hundreds of years into the future, it will be around Greenland that sea level drops, if Greenland is the major source of ice loss on our planet. Mm 